That's what I'm hearing. It, it, it's so deep, bro. It's so deep. Really? Oh, wow. Yeah, it's, it's like uh, Rick and Morty, except more kind of hippie, you know, a little bit more uh, hippie, but it's just as intelligent. Nice. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what's the name of that show again? Uh, Midnight Gospel. Midnight Gospel. Okay, we're live now, so I wanted people to know to go watch. Uh, perfect. Midnight Gospel. I don't know if they caught everything yeah, Dunkel, beforehand. Duncan Trussell and Dr. Drew's uh, new show on Netflix <clears throat> called The Midnight Gospel. You're, you're the second person <laughs> this week, so that's all it takes. It depends on the people who are recommending it, of course. Of uh, course. Yeah, two two high quality suggestions in one week. I'm going to be tuning in in this weekend. All right, we got Brian McKenzie here. He is a uh, performance geek across the board. Uh, shit, man. Uh, we've hung out quite a bit, and I've interviewed you quite a bit. And yep. Yeah, I just want to remind everybody, man. I've been following, I've been following Brian since, man. I want to say it was maybe 2008. 2008, mm -hmm. I started uh, doing your wow. CrossFit running, endurance, yeah. running stuff, and fucking uh, watched you go through, uh, you know, basically saying, hey, we should be strength training as endurance athletes and working on running mechanics to getting into breath and ice and, and all that mess. So yeah. I'm uh, stoked to have you on. And, and uh, I, I'm also really excited to be able to interview you during this progression. Like, oh, okay. I would love to like go and watch our first interview, which was fucking hilarious. Fucking... Oh wow. Wasn't that at uh in it was Tennessee? At, yeah, it was at my gym in it, Tennessee. I, yeah, I it's it, funny as I didn't even think about that. As Anna, as I'm talking about you, that scene jumped in my head. That scene jumped in my head. That was fun. Brother, uh, that was a that was actually a pretty surreal time for me. Um, because I mean I think I was out at Froning's place, wasn't I at that time? Um, and then we came to, I know we were doing a seminar as well. I'm pretty sure. And then we came to like, I knew about you guys and I, I, I was like, well, this is going to be interesting. I'm wondering if Chris is going to fucking contain himself. <laughs> and, uh, you know, cause... no. <laughs> so I didn't know, you know, and, and you know how, I, you know, and I'm, I'm not like, you know, I, I'm this like kind of ex punk rocker. I'm still punk rock, but you know, I, you know, I'm like, I'm not going to take shit from anybody. So I'm going to fucking, you know, anyway, it was, it was an interesting <laughs> time. And I, you know, I felt like I walked out of that thing and Chris was drinking too. He was drinking. <laughs> I think, was he, was he trying to, did you have the experience of him trying to push your buttons? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. He tended yeah, to yeah. do that. But he and I actually walked out of that, like, almost like best friends. Yeah, yeah, you, know? you guys have some things in common. That was yes. the thing, that was a thing. Yeah. That was probably like, like, yeah. like you push people's buttons too. And totally. as you've gotten totally. older, oh, yeah. you know, gotten a little, little smoother. I think we all do. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not out to prove as much anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get it. Uh, so, I, all right, we're, we're, um, we're in the middle of a, a world where people are freaking out about the respiratory health. And it, it seems like you are uh, you like uniquely positioned. <laughs> like you've been I, plan, I plan this whole thing. <laughs> yeah, like you're like, you and fucking Bill Gates got together. I, I know what's yeah. going on here. <laughs> but I, 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 I wish I was in, in, the, in, the, in that, you know, ecosystem of Bill Gates. Yeah, I wish you had the level of influence he has. That would, yeah, that would be a much better scenario. Yeah. Market, in my humble opinion. So, um, yeah, I mean, people, I, I know that I, um, when all this went down, I started looking at coronavirus and the symptoms mm -hmm. and I go, oh, well, like I'm in a pretty good position myself, do a lot of breath work, train, mm -hmm. take really good care of myself. And I could be doing a lot better and, uh, you know, started, you know, what else am I going to do? I fucking, we're in quarantine. So might as well just train and eat, sleep and do some work and, and uh, get as healthy as we can get. So what, uh, are you in the same boat or has, has nothing really changed for you? Or, or is there something that like, oh, this ping me and now I'm putting a little more attention here. 
I mean, my life has not really changed. Like kind of before we started recording, my life really has not changed much in the last four years. Um, even with this pandemic going on, because my, I work from home and I like, I mean, look, nobody's going to tell me I can't go out on the trails. Right. Like, and go out and get outside. I'm going to do that regardless of what's happening. Yeah. Um, but I'll keep my distance. Um, nonetheless, um, it's interesting because I, I mean, I probably do at least one consult or call a day with somebody at a high level who is concerned or has COVID. And, you know, it's, the focus has become, you know, like the interesting thing here is that, you know, the scary part is that people actually, it's, it's like Rob did this really well, who I work with. He's like, look, people right now are like wanting to learn how they, they want to go. It's like learning to deadlift and just wanting to pull 400 pounds off the ground. Yeah. Immediately. And people don't understand that's not how this works. And, you know, unfortunately in the fitness industry, we've created quite the illusion um, of what health is and health is interrelated with performance. And that's not necessarily true. Um, and yeah, I, I, I made a comment about that on Instagram last week and I got got some people that, yeah, it was like a response to a comment that came into this thing and people wanted to cite some high level athletes and like, well, they got it. And I'm like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it turns out that, you know, I mean, a lot of the work I've done in the last six or seven years has seen even at the highest level world champions, uh, very, uh, we, we've seen fairly CO2 intolerant. And when I say that, I don't mean to just like confuse everybody with saying that, but when I say CO2 intolerant, that means they're not metabolically efficient. CO2 is a metabolic stress messenger. And it, it works with our breathing. We, we take a conscious breath because of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is rolled in Is that when we take a, a big sigh? Like we take a big sigh, is that a sign of like our body wanting uh, to get yeah, that yeah, out? That, yeah, that can, yeah, it could be. In, in, in a lot of cases, yawning um, becomes something that's, you know, like that's funny <clears> because, you know, I, I, I can't, this is theory, but based on everything I've looked at, nobody's really been able to, you know, figure out what yawning really is for. And the fact is, is it, it's because you're fucking tired. <laughs> People like, like, it's like, we need all this like inform, And it's like, yeah, your body is literally telling you, you are tired. And yes, it's a contagious thing if you see somebody else do it. But mo- by and large, most people don't recognize when they're actually tired. Yeah. And, and, they, and so what they do is they caffeinate or they blow through it and go work out or they go, they just ignore that response versus just like chilling out for a minute. My dog doesn't ignore it. You know? Yeah. Um, that said, you know, sometimes it's, you know, you do need to shut it off and you need to turn it on, but whatever, uh, you know, back to the whole COVID, you know, this whole thing is, you know, breathing is about understanding a relationship between carbon dioxide and oxygen, everything in this system that we have, that's called a human being, depends on oxygen so our physiology is completely dependent upon oxygen because aerobic metabolism or cellular respiration is the vehicle for how we move energy the only way we get to move that oxygen that energy is if we have a good relationship with carbon dioxide because hemoglobin prefers to have a relation a, a tighter relationship to carbon dioxide. So hemoglobin is what sits inside the red blood cell. It's part of the hemi group. It attracts oxygen into the red blood cell and transports it. But it also transports carbon dioxide. And by and large, most people are over breathers or because of our kind of stressed lifestyles that we lead and and our um, lack of movement lifestyles, we've become very inefficient at these things. Uh, the civilized, like there's a, there was a divergent situation that happened with civilization, um, largely. And that was convenience, that was comfort, that was not doing as much. And that came with a lot of things in the pipeline, including how we eat and what we ate. 
because our jaws have changed, which changed our sinus structures, which you'll never see a single, you'll, you can go back in records as far as you want. And if anybody's recorded what they've seen with indigenous culture and breathing, you will see a mouth wide shut society. You will see a society that does not talk a whole lot. They have intention with what they speak. A lot of words have dual meanings like pranayama, like esoteric words, you know, yeah. energy, breath control it's the same thing yeah there's 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 hebrew language for the same thing as well um you know there's there's a, there's a lot of stuff down the pipeline that i could get into and i don't want to go too far into the weeds but we lost connection to all of this by not listening to those who came before us and that for the in the united states that was native american culture it, hey check this out we don't set up in floodplains in permanent resident, New Orleans and Houston. <laughs> okay. Like <laughs> these are just simple things right. that are really like, like why, like why did we decide to do that? Because we're just not listening to things and we think we're better than what nature has created or used in order to create something to get rid of water that's coming out of something. Right. Yeah. Um, we think we're better or, 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 you know, or stronger than this in a large regard. So we don't, we just don't, we don't listen real well. And part of that listening was how you treat, you know, the land and, and that land is a part of you and I, and that is, you know, a part of like why we move and like, look, I'm not going to pretend that I don't live in a house and I don't drive a car and I don't like, I, I'm a part of civilized world. I'm complicit in this whole fucking thing. Trust me. Yeah, I, I'm um, with you. I've, I've I've had a lot of time. I spent a lot of time in nature with indigenous people doing doing their things, and then I get in a a car and I drive to the airport and I fly international, and I'm sitting there thinking, "Fuck, man, what a this is weird. This is it's weird. weird. Like, like it's I, weird. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, should I be doing this? Now, it's, it's, yeah, yeah." And, and here, I'm not suggesting we don't. What I'm suggesting is that, you know, and, and I mean, this is kind of the language that you just used too. And I'm not like coming at you. I'm not coming at anybody. My, uh, my angle here is very different from what's going on in the world right now, especially the breath space. Like I'm actually pretty disgusted with the people in the breath space um, and the wellness space. Um, I, I'm, I'm never going to call, I'm not going to call anybody out like anything like that, but I'm just, there, there's a lot of people who are taking advantage of a situation which they don't understand, you know, like we don't understand what this virus is totally doing, but we do understand that like those of us who are healthy, who actually have a breath practice, who actually exercise enough, <clears throat> understand breath control to some degree, like understand eating real food is probably the best option, <laughs> like, you know, yeah. staying hydrated, taking care of ourselves. This, so we are nature. We love to disguise it as though nature is out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and there's, it's not that that's not true. That is nature back there on the trails behind me. But this is nature. Yeah. I am nature. But I became so disconnected to what this was and is that I've had to create this duality that yeah. i can say like yesterday earth day like fuck that talk about being disgusted again but you know i i couldn't i can't tell you how many fucking out of shape fat obese unhealthy human beings are putting things out about saving the earth and i'm like let me get this oh brian you just i just lost your audio for some reason And we're waiting on uh, Brian's audio to come back. Let's see. I think maybe it's your headset. How's All that? Right. Oh, perfect. Perfect. All right. You, yeah, you left okay. off with uh, there's some, I guess you could say, unhealthy people yeah i mean there are some there's some fairly unhealthy people out there <clears throat> hammering on society human beings about how we treat this planet and i i have a i have an inherent problem with that in that anybody who is not keeping their own house in order 
has no right to sit there and tell the rest of the world how they should be treating our house. Yeah. And, you know, and I, and this is where the problem lies is that we lost your audio again. We'll get this solved, folks. No big deal. I think uh, he's going to switch over to something that's going to work long term. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, sorry. My headphones. Were I get it. Those fine. things can be Technology glitchy wrong. with Zoom. Yeah. Um, anyway, there's just there's, there's this incredible disconnection with self and that is largely a denial of being and we love to put everything we've got kind of on everybody else um it, it, like our own like i don't have any responsibility towards what it is i have going on with me but i'm going to put everything else on that, that, I, that I'm going to look at the totality of the planet, you know, and, you know, the fact that the earth is being destroyed by human beings um, and, you know, you all are responsible. We're so bad. And it's like, hey, maybe if you started treating yourself a little bit better, people would actually start treating themselves a little bit better. You yeah. know, start taking a little bit more responsibility for your own health, taking a little bit more responsibility for your own housekeeping and understanding how to make a better decision and how it's all connected and moving more. And, you know, I mean, it's just, all of this goes down the line. I mean, it, it's just, it becomes difficult for me because I'm not somebody who's about, Hey, let's, let's just do this calm, hippy dippy breathing practice. I'm like, wh what we're doing is, Hey, when you're on fire, if your tool does, if you're not using your tools, they don't work. Yeah. So you can do all the meditation and breathing you want, but if you can't do that while you're fucking, you know, while somebody's coming at you or you're, you know, in the heat of a moment, your tools don't work or you don't understand them. And so this is where the work starts to really take place. And we try to kind of separate the, you know, this thing into what are you doing right now? Like you don't need to just go sit down. Look, I sit down I have a breath practice. That is not what I'm saying. That's only training. Right. But when I shut up here and you start talking, I will default into some organized breathing patterns so that I'm actually paying attention to you and listening to you so that I'm not drifting off like the old Brian used to and start <laughs> thinking about what he's going to say next. What is, uh, what does that organized breathing pattern look like? Uh, I, I, uh, I know what you're talking about doing a lot of interviews over the years. There's, it used to be, I used to worry about my own mind needing to keep up with what was going on. And then I did some practices that taught me how to listen to people. <laughs> like, holy shit. And now the trick is when I talk to people about podcasting is when you're having a conversation, breathe really deep into your belly and wait like like really be present with the conversation and it uh that that's that's really the trick that's not what people want to hear normally but what is the what is this breathing breathing pattern organized breathing pattern you're talking about well there's it could be several is what it could be okay. um you know but the For idea, listening <laughs> yeah well I mean, the idea is, is that, I mean, look, I was just doing two things, listening to you and adjusting my stand so that I could do that. But I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm intentionally inhaling on key parts. I'm intentionally controlling my exhale as well. Right. It, it, you know, and I know that if I take a full inhale, I'm also like, and this is just through observation, but then also when you look at research and you start to study things, you start to see things, right? Like yeah. a full inhale is going to elicit a parasympathetic response at the top end because I'm actually filling the, the end ranges of my lungs, right? <laughs> the top ends of them. And I'm only going to achieve that if I'm nasal breathing. Meaning I don't do that if I'm, it's almost impossible. Like, so it's, it's almost impossible to get a full breath with your mouth. 
You are correct. You just move more air with your mouth. Okay. More, more volume per second. You got it. Yep. And this okay. is one of the big things with why nasal breathing is so important is that <clears throat> it actually just, the, the most important thing I think with it, well, they're all, it's all important, but is that it actually slows respiration rate. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the thing. So yeah. when I take people and I, you know, take an athlete and I'm like, Hey, you got three, four weeks of nasal only breathing with your training. And they're like, what? And I'm like, just do that. That's all we need to do right now. Trust me. You can go as hard as you want, as long as you can keep your trap shut. Then we can learn to gear up and use specific patterns after that. But that tells me right there, we've just restructured how they, how they use their aerobic system. Got it. So let, let's rewind a bit. You were talking about uh, carbon dioxide tolerance and all of this. Why is that important? Yeah. So CO2 is a metabolic stress messenger of the body. And our psychometabolic reactivity is how we react to carbon dioxide. We have respirate. I'll start with the brain. All right. So we have our respiration centers are set up in the brain stem. The brain stem is the oldest part of the body, all, oldest part of the brain called the reptilian brain. And it's there for a reason. It sends out autonomic processes, right? It's the end result of emotions and thinking and sending out directives. Autonomic refers to autopilot, right? Yeah. The entire goal of our nervous system is to be autonomous. This is very important to understand. Okay. Meaning that is efficiency. Okay. But you cannot learn anything in an autonomous state. Right. So the, if yeah. I'm, if I'm in this autonomous motion, I'm not going to learn in anything. If I'm just, if so, when I'm brushing my teeth or I'm driving my car and having a conversation, like I'm not going to be learning much. Right. Like I'm a lot of the things are going on autopilot. Right. And, and so, Go ahead. I mean, and is it accurate to say if you're in a stress state, you're <laughs> more likely to be in the uh, to be autonomous? Bingo. Right. That is what it's for. Yeah. Get get the f out of dodge. Yeah. Like, right. <laughs> so, going back to CO two, the respiration centers are set up in that brain stem, and they pick up on the carotid artery and the aortic artery that's where the detection systems are in. So now the detection systems now tell us they're in the, they're going outwards. So it's a predictive system. All right. It's not an actual. So is it, 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 is it predictive of what's, uh, is it a future predictor? Yep. It's okay. trying to predict the future. And so because of the lifestyles that we lead and we're not outside being chased by wolves i mean most of us aren't speak for right? yourself no you are no... now but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you're just keeping you're just keeping your your, your natural state in check mm -hmm. but I, I i would beg to, i would beg to uh offer up that any human being who actually does put themselves in situations like that doesn't respond to shit in society the same way that people who actually just stay in society respond to it why well, here's why. Because the predictive system runs haywire because of our thinking and our, our emotions. So we get emotional responses to things and the panic switch is there for a reason. We're told to take a breath based on where we think the carbon dioxide is going to be at. The, the interesting part here is that there is an actual panic switch when we have when we hold our breath or when CO2 rises. And you don't need an amygdala or a fear center in order for this to go off. So people who actually have suppressed amygdalas or or, or have none, right? These are usually the what the daredevils that is, yes, is that but right? beyond that and people with diseases that literally, you know, don't and they they like they have to have like caretakers and stuff because it turns out you actually need fear to stay alive. So Interesting. yeah, there's a lot of hippies I've gotten in arguments with that about because they think fear is like the leading cause of, you know, and this is something I disagree. I think it was a, uh, uh, um, um, some famous dude's quote about fear being the root of all 
evil and whatever. Uh, right. I think it was Gandhi, actually. Uh, I, I disagree with that. Uh, it, that. It takes context. And fear is, is absolutely necessary. It's understanding fear and where it's coming from so that I can learn from it, right? And we put fear in place and we put these mechanisms in place to where anger, resentment, frustration, fear start to intrude on this breath center, right? So we're bypassing these switches to some degree. And so there's how the brain and the nervous system work, right? But here's the interesting part is that my breath is directly interwoven into my nervous system. So my inhale is sympathetic in nature. My exhale is a suppression of sympathetic activity. <clears throat> so it's like when people go jump in ice tubs and they can't control their breath, it's not that they can't control their breath, they can't control their exhale. Can't control they, the exhale. They can't control it because it's a sympathetic high up regulation at first, right? And go, yeah. go jump in and feel it. You'll get it the first two breaths if you're really good. Like you start to see it and you're like, oh, like, like it trips yeah. up. Right? Yeah. If you go work out really hard and you try and control your exhale, you'll find a trip up on that way out. And you're like, Ugh. like, and you have yeah. to inhale again. Okay. There's like a, a, a stutter in the breath. You got, that's it, brother. That's yeah. it. That stutter is your sympathetic nervous system going, yo, we still need to be on. Right. Yeah. So we have played around with this enough to integrate places. And it turns out that if you actually just do, I don't know, five or 10 breaths like this, and you blow off a little carbon dioxide, you can then control your exhale. I now control the carbon dioxide. So I offloaded carbon dioxide and I so, tripwired wired the system. So if I'm feeling, if I'm feeling like I need air, yeah, a handful of breaths like you just did, and then resume nasal breathing. Then resume to controlled nasal breathing and try and slow and control your exhale. If you can double time your exhale off of your inhale, you will for sure be parasympathetic to dominant. What? So I, I get the I get the the need or uh, I don't know about the need, but the the desire to have that throughout the day. I'm working throughout the day. I'm talking to you. I'm gonna be on my laptop. Yeah, you need to transition. I yeah, mean, so, nasal breathing the whole time, deep into my belly, but then I'm going to go run later. Yeah. And um, is it, is it, what, what, where am I at when, is there a benefit to me upregulating myself during that run? Uh, if I'm going to go yeah. for distance or yeah. what, do I want to stay relaxed? How does this yeah. work? Yeah, 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 yeah. What do you want? What are you trying to achieve higher performance? Like, look, there's a time and a place for mouth breathing. If you don't understand that, it's time to do some work towards that. And this is what we're offering up. This is why, I, look, baseline, fundamental. Here's the, here's, the, here's the basics of breath work. Understand the difference between nose and mouth breathing. What does one do? What does the other? When is it necessary to mouth breathe? Okay, let's work through that. If I'm doing high intensity work, I'm going to have to mouth breathe at some point because the metabolic demand is saying I need more oxygen in the environment, right? In order to work. It's like an Olympic weight lift. Like if I do something explosive, there's just not in enough oxygen in that environment in order for it to work. Glycogen's not even there. And so we have to go creatine phosphagen, right? Yeah. So it's just snap because it's like, I'm trying to generate power through that. So people who don't, who are like aerobic or endurance athletes struggle really hard with high explosive work like that, because that system has, it's so oxygen uh, rich. It's so type, you know, one fiber rich that it's like, Oh, like I'm, I, I don't have any ability to transfer over with this. Right. There's no stimulus. Exactly. Yeah. Not enough stimulus. Right. And so it's, if I'm going to go on a run, if I like, what's my goal for the run? If I want to go for a long run, well, that's a, that's a pretty aerobic effort. Right. But if I want to do some serious training in that run, maybe I want to throw in a couple like five or six high effort repeats. Right. The idea is how, what am I trying to achieve with that? The objective is better oxygen transportation. <clears throat> right. So, 
if I'm going to go into a high effort, when does the transition happen from nose to mouth? When do I need to do that? And how quickly can I get back to my nose? That tells me exactly when I'm actually aerobic again. It, it's okay if it's not immediately. That just means we've got work to do and we've got an opportunity to do more work. The objective is, is to close that window on how quickly I can actually get back to a highly aerobic state because that's the goal. The goal of all training is to make a better decision, right? It just so happens that making a better decision is parasympathetic in tone and making and being parasympathetic in tone is more aerobically efficient. So the physiology works with the neurobiology in that it doesn't matter if I'm working out hard or if I'm carrying a conversation with you right now and I'm talking, I'm offloading carbon dioxide as I talk. Yeah. Therefore, I'm removing the variable carbon dioxide from a lot of the environment. So if I don't have enough oxygen available because there's not enough carbon dioxide available, the system is, is so intelligent that it just starts leaning more sympathetically and using up more glucose from that anaerobic side. And then eventually- So the more you're talking, the more, more anaerobic you're going. You got it, brother. The more you are using up of the glucose in terms of those anaerobic processes. It, 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 look, we've put on metabolic carts and done this. Gone out for a walk, shut my mouth, gone out, for, stopped, came back, gone out for a walk, opened my mouth, kept my mouth open and breathed through my mouth. Two entirely different energy systems are being used. Interesting. So how do we know? How do we know? You're saying high level athletes, and yeah. you know, it's, it's the whole spectrum of human beings. Yeah. If yeah. you're, if you're a high level athlete, you're not, you're not automatically, uh, I guess you, you don't get say, a hall pass. Yeah. You're not in shape you're, or your, your breathing may not be in shape. You may not have your yeah, uh, yeah. CO2 you're, tolerance you're not, may you're be not as, poor. Yeah. You're pro you're more than likely better off than most. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that you are aerobically efficient. Right. And, and, and this is like, look, it, this can't, I'm not saying this is everybody, but the fact is, is I have seen enough to where like, look, man, we are supper culture, especially in sports and yeah. athletes in particular in working sports are all about how hard I can work, not yeah. how efficiently I can work. Yeah. Even, even if, even if we tell ourselves intellectually, we know work smarter, not harder and all that. There's still that oh, yeah. pattern from, you know, oh. our youth. Cause I mean, like, look, our coaches and parents, when we were six, seven, eight years old, they were saying this kind of stuff to us. They didn't know any better. No, they didn't, they didn't know no, what no, they no, were in bed. That's, that's, that's the only thing they know. No, I don't fault my parents for the way, for, for the problems that I had as a kid anymore. They did the best they could with everything they had. Yeah. And that's the, that's reality. What isn't reality is the story that I painted that like, you know, Oh, my dad was an asshole and we didn't get along and this and that and him and did da, 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 this to me. Well, I'm an adult now and I can either take responsibility for understanding that process or, or creating conjecture and making it personal that he was actually doing those things to me because it was about me when in essence it was never about me. It was, he only had certain tools, right? Yeah. We only have certain tools and if we're doing the best we can, we're doing the best we can. Yeah. You know? I find, um, I find a lot of, uh, I'll be coaching people a lot of times when they have a complaint about one of their parents or both their parents, it's a lot of what was not happening <laughs> that, that they were focusing on and not on what was happening. And so it's, uh, it, yeah, like you were saying, it's not reality. Like the reality is they did a bunch of things. And the thing that's not reality is all the things they didn't do. Yeah. And I mean, this is the beauty. Yeah. This is the beauty of being human. I mean, so I, I do, I do, uh, I run a program at San Quentin. And so I go in and see the inmates and I haven't been able to go in for like oh, the dude. last month, obviously. Dude, I've been, I've been seeing that on Instagram. I go, what yeah. is Brian doing? This is awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's yeah. fucking, it, it's the greatest teaching experience I've ever had. Cause I've, I, I've never had anybody and I've had a, I've worked with a lot of people, man, like over 10,000 people. Right. I have never had anybody 
more engaged and wanting to learn, right? Than these guys. That in and of itself tells me a story, right? But I do, I, I, I do something with them where I, I stuck a chair in the center of the room and we, we, there's about 30 guys and we're in a circle. And I'm like, all right, what's in the middle of the room? What's in the middle of the circle? And everybody's like a chair and everybody agrees that it's a chair. Right, all right, write down on a piece of paper what you see in that chair. And everybody wrote down something different. Said, so here's reality, that's a chair. Now, what did you see? What did you see? What did you see? What did you see? That's what you see. And you just need to be heard or seen on what it is you see. But the reality is that's still just a chair. And we exist in an environment where we're creating stories around things up here. But the, and, and that's great because that's what we've got a prefrontal cortex for. But we've also got that prefrontal cortex in order to pull us back into it's just a fucking chair. <laughs> yeah so I, if i'm sitting in traffic and i'm fucking going fuck this and this was an epiphany i had when i lived in southern california before i left for the middle of nowhere right i was like i am choosing to be here i am getting angry at my choices not yeah. the fact that i'm actually sitting and and so i'm it was just this mind i'm like the reality is where am i trying to go and what am i going to do when i get there <laughs> <laughs> right so yeah. the whole system starts to play itself out and guess what i'm doing when i'm doing that i'm turning on more aggressive music and it's not that aggressive music's not okay i still listen to it but it's i'm getting heated i'm my breathing's changing you know sometimes you know I, so, some of those times i was doing things like wim hof oh like <sighs> uh, i'm up regulating myself oh weird like you know like these are all, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with Wim Hof method. It's great. You yeah. know, it's just another, you know, it's just another technique that's been passed down that was, you know, thousands of years old. But, you know, it, all of these things are there for a reason. There's a time and a place to upregulate. There's a time and a place to downregulate. So if you've got your day and I'm going to be talking to people all day, well, I better behoove me to keep my mouth closed between that and maybe do a couple breath cycles or look outside onto the horizon or out into a peripheral way in order to shift myself down in between these things so that when it comes time to actually do something physically that I can engage in that in the manner that I want to. And so I can then orchestrate my, like my breathing is the gateway to understanding what I'm doing metabolically. So if you're training for something, you're trying to elicit a metabolic reaction. Your breath is the direct connection to that. Your heart rate is late. How heart rate has continued to become this thing that tell people what zone they're in is insanity. This is one of the things we're going to try and just absolutely shatter. And, and the fact is, is we're going to because I can show people at 200 watts on a bike mouth breathing and that same 200 watts nasal breathing and they're two different energy systems and yet the heart rate goes you know, doesn't change. And it's like, oh, weird. Wonder what's going on there. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the whole uh, being in the fat burning zone or we're doing cardio or whatever is way less to do with the heart rate and way more to do with what's the going heart on with the breath. Correct. The heart rate got into this game because we, what we would do, what we do is we put people on a metabolic cart and they strap them into a heart rate. And so the easiest thing to do is to correlate a heart rate with specific times when CO2 and gas exchange changes. The, the odd thing is, is that no scientist or nobody said, yeah, this changes throughout the entire day based on how you're dealing with stress or how much stress you've taken on. And oh, by the way, Let's go back to that CO2 thing and, meta and, and psychometabolic reactivity. If I'm in a bad space or if I've taken on too much and I've been thinking too much, right? I have suppressed my ability to tolerate carbon dioxide. So I've now metabolically changed what's going to happen when I go train. And thus my heart rate at 140 that's supposed to be fat burning is no longer fat burning. That's completely changed and that changed in a day and so that's I, the, 
Yeah. I, I was working with a, a Czech practitioner a while back and uh, like, I, I love those guys. Uh, and uh, he, he goes, okay, you're really active. You're, you move a lot. Uh, you're hot. Uh, you run hot. Uh, and, uh, and you, you probably think a lot, like just the type of person you are. I was like, okay. I mean, I don't know how much I think compared to other people. And, uh, he goes, yeah. So basically the program was to lower the volume, spend more time in the ice. Uh, and, uh, uh and do act like do something to get my mind to, to chill the fuck out. And when, when that was brought to my attention, I go, I started looking at the days where I was using my mind a lot, where there was a lot of attention going into my head. And then going and training and those training sessions were shit. It was just, everything felt hard, but on the days where I was able, and now I'm, now I've got my whole day mapped out in a way and I'm, I'm, I'm relaxed the other day. I don't have like, every once in a while I'll have like a training session where it's like, Oh, I came in with stress and whatever. But I, I started taking account for how much mental energy I'm using in a day and attribute like, like that's work that's something that I need to be watching. And I think that it's commonly overlooked and it's, you know, I, I, I've heard so many times and read so many times, you know, so many X percent of your, your calories are burned by the brain. I'm like, okay, cool. Um, and, and then now I'm looking at, I'm going, makes sense. I could totally wear myself out thinking all day. Chess players in tournaments can burn upwards of 6,000 calories a day. What? Free divers can burn almost 1,000 calories an hour diving. And their heart rate maybe, maybe gets up to yours and my resting heart rate. We, we are confused. we, I, we I, you know we, what the, the gym uh, of the future the gym bro, of the future I, is gonna I, be I, it's gonna be all chess <laughs> look man I, I i'd love to tell you like i didn't come up with this shit okay this was shit that hit me like a fucking right hook out of nowhere and i was like holy shit i've been talking about heart rate holy shit i've been like i was talking about this nutrition program okay. oh my god like you know and it's like Oh my God. Like so what I've do you think so about? Yeah. Yeah. No, I get, it. I'm with you. Like here, man. Uh, but this look. Is like, when I say we are confused, I am literally meaning me. I'm involved in that. Like, yes, we are very confused. <laughs> we have not made any biological advancements. We have made technological and medicinal advancements in our culture. That is all we've done. There is no biological advancement right now. In fact, it's a deterioration. We think we're so fucking smart because we create technology to do shit that makes us more dependent on it. And, and we don't seek a cure. A cure is painful. We seek relief. Mm. Well said. Man, I mean, that's not me. That's, that's, um, <laughs> uh, that, that's um, I think his name, DeMello, um, from a, a book is called Awareness. And, you know, I, my, the thing I came up with is the cure to anything is understanding. That's it. The problem is, is nobody wants to understand shit. No, just want, like you said, the relief. That's it's, it, man. It's a symptom that's bothersome. Yes. And uh, yeah, we definitely have a society, um, you know, like you're saying, including myself, where uh, how often am I seeking relief over no. getting down to the root cause of whatever's oh, going on? Day. I do like, yeah. I, it's the smallest things, bro. If you really want to be honest with yourself, it's like the small, I'm like, Oh wow. Like I really like, but I, we need it. It's how the universe works. Like it's how the yin and the yang work. It's how, like, you have to have some sort of stability with inside the chaos. Like if it's chaotic all the time, you're screwed. You know, you've got to have some relief, but the problem is, and it's like, I constantly think about the kids who are brought up in these ultra rich families you know and it and people like are like oh they are given all these advantages i don't know i don't think that's an advantage 
Yeah, the, the older I get, the more I see it as a problem. Like, yeah, it's, because you spent time in other cultures, bro. And here's the yeah. here's the problem with the United States and what our culture's done. And I'm I'm with you. I'm, I'm I'm guessing on this is that you know in other cultures, they look at people who decided not to go after wealth, but decided to go after a simple life as incredibly wise human beings. And we look at people who are incredibly wealthy as the actual wisest people in the land. And it, I'm not saying that they're not wise or they're not good at what they're doing, but there is a vi there, we do not look at people who decide to take the simple life and be a part, like really be a part of society in, in its in its whole um, versus living in a sheltered, covered life. And this is what I mean with kids who are brought up in these environments. They're now, they have bank accounts before anybody else. They have more money. They don't have to worry about money. So, <laughs> so you're removing the variables. You're giving relief to something that's never going to understand what that actually means. And it goes far beyond just money, right? It go, like, it's like anything at the push of a button. And this is where I'm talking about health and, and society and how it all kind of pans out is it's like, this is the byproduct. This is the planet, man. This is yeah. like, we don't get our shit. To, like, guess what? Get, guess who's not treating the planet like shit? Mother Teresa, who yeah. went without. Gandhi, who went without. Christ, who went without. The Buddha, who went without. Like, I'll just keep going. Like, yeah, you know, these cultures and these people, they're like, I mean, they're regarded, <clears throat> they're held up highly because of what they did. And they understood something that was important. And we continue to just reinforce this thing. And then we're sitting in it right now. Yeah. In an economy that's an illusion. <laughs> yeah. The, like the idea of, I mean, going all the way back to the beginning of the interview here and you're yeah. talking about get your own house in order and when when we look at uh i'm with you this past week i um i i was interacting with some people on social media and i i got into some some deeper water than i really cared to i was just i was just asking questions yeah uh, to try to get people thinking and then of course i'm uh causing some emotional triggers and people are getting pissed at me. And, and I'm like, I, I actually don't even want to be having this conversation. And yeah. I go, it's a distraction. And then I, I put together a list. I literally, in my notes, I have house in order to do list. And um, I talk about getting the house in order a lot. And it's cool to hear you say that. And um, I'm sitting here and, you know, there's, there's 10 things on the list. You know, there's some things I need to get in order. And for me to be on the internet arguing with people and spending any effort, mental, again, like, like, like you're talking about this mental space causing stress for no fucking reason. Um, and when I've got more important stuff to do, which is get my house in order. And then we look at, um, I mean, I, I have a history of working to, you know, and making money when stressed, when, when things aren't going my way, it's like, well, I know what to do. That'll make me, that'll give me a little hit and I'll feel better uh, because I, I did a thing that, that made the business some money or something like that. And that's not when I'm the happiest. That's not when things are the smoothest and that's not when I'm being the friendliest to the planet. And yeah, I, I can see how financial wealth can create a separation it's like almost like you you're in a uh, you, you get a, a big house you're separate from the rest of society mm -hmm. disconnected from self um, it, it's easier to be disconnected from self because there's all this outside stimulus um, and what what we're looking at right now is everyone's seem it seems like there's this really big threat that's been produced uh, whether it be by the planet or humans and it sounds like to you it wouldn't matter uh nature produced it even if humans created it and fuck man like we did this well we did this yeah too. Like, like it's not look and, look, and look, is there going to be look, something yes else and no. yes and no 
all right, yes, we did. Yes, we're responsible for stuff that shit. Like we, we, we don't long-term think anything. We short-term everything and we forget about history, right? In fact, we teach history that is a one-sided variable for certain people to accelerate the same bullshit or perpetuate the same things that continue to drive us into the problems that we continue to see, right? Um, we look, any species or any organism wants to take over. You, you let mice go without, they're going to take over your fucking house. Yeah. So will cockroaches. <laughs> so will deer. <clears throat> yeah. So will pigs. The, like, it just so happens any species will do this. And I'm not like, look, we do have a responsibility. But I think that responsibility begins with me. Yeah. That was something I was taught a long time ago, but it took me a long time to fucking really understand. <laughs> like, like fifth, like fifth, 20, more than 20 years ago, I was taught that. And it took me probably 15 years to catch on to that shit. And yeah. what responsibility meant. And I'm still learning what that means today to a large degree. But the fact of the matter is, is I've backed off of trying to tell people what they have to do and just started showing people what I'm doing. Yeah. And how I'm doing it and what it what's changed in my life as a result of it. And the amount of feedback I get on that and the opportunities that have come as a result of that far exceed anything I've been given in the past. Um, we have opportunity in history and we ignore it. You know, um, it, it's so interesting because I, I, I love uh, the history of the United States to a large degree, except told from the other side of things to to, yeah, like I mean, it's like kind of crazy. I, I grew up reading a version, and then I become an adult, and then all this stuff starts coming out. I'm going, I think I learned a, a small fraction of what uh, oh. of what happened. Like my favorite writer is James Baldwin, and that happened out of sheer, um, like th that happened as a relationship with a uh, a PhD who teaches at Tar Harvard. She teaches African American studies, and she's a speaker, and I she picked up on some stuff she was doing and I was like James Baldwin and I I had heard of him but then I started reading and I was just I, I don't know who James Baldwin is. He, he's he's a fantastic he was a civil rights writer uh he he, he was with he hung out with Dr. King um you know a, a, a lot of he was a he was a Malcolm X he was very much involved in all of that but <clears throat> I also look at things from the Native American perspective, but there's, there, you know, there's, there's a, there's a book out there that's probably one of the best written historical documents on Native American history. And it's done by a white guy. Um, it's called Empire of the Summer Moon. And it's about Quanah Parker, who is the son of Cynthia Ann Parker, who was a woman who was captured by the Comanche when she was like seven. And she was raised Comanche, ended up marrying a chief and ended up having this kid. And Quanah Parker was the last of the Comanche. And the interesting thing about all this historical stuff and how it was played out was how we progressed into the prairie and what we continued to do, but what we didn't pay attention to. And all of the accuracy of the documentation of this stuff and how it happened. And I'm not saying one side or the other, but, you know, the interesting part is, is that, you know, had the Colt revolver never been invented, this place would be very, very, very different. The Colt revolver is the only reason why the Comanche Indian did not take over the entire nation for what it was, because they knew how to fought, fight off of horseback and no other culture knew how to do that very well. And it was what they taught their kids. But you see within the process of, the, of history and what they're doing, and it just so happens, a guy who wrote a book in the same era by the name of George Caitlin called Shut Your Mouth and Save Your Life was in the United States at the time documenting indigenous cultures. And, the, and he's documented throughout this book talking about the Comanches and other tribes and what was going on and what they wore and how they maneuvered and what in all of this very interesting stuff. It's the same guy who picked up on and through all this historical data, the most important thing that he picked up on being that nobody was breathing through their mouths. And they were terrified of getting the 
black mouth, which is what they called civilized man. Interesting. And nobody paid attention to that back then. Well, of course not. <laughs> no, but it, yeah. I mean, it's like that's 1867 Dude. or something, right? And it's, it's just, it's crazy because I... I, I think I'm the only one who picked up on this, but it's only because I re read Caitlin's work about Shut Your Mouth. Then I'm reading this book, and I'm, this is the second or yeah, third time. Yeah, you put I'm the two the together. Damn. And I'm like, holy shit, this is the same guy. <laughs> like, and there's nothing about nose breathing in there, but culturally, right. you're hearing what is going on and how they survive. How, dude, the, the Comanche Indians could ride like triple if not quadruple the range of any other person in the world why could they do that and it's like they're not that different their biology is the same yeah like and where are we at now we're we, we don't even touch what these people were capable of doing in terms of shooting bow and arrow or accuracy even with a rifle like we're so in a different world and we think this just goes into where we believe we're at because we drive in cars and we talk on phones that have supercomputers. We're so smart. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it, it's, it's interesting how, uh, technology, there's this huge assumption that comes in with technology of like, I mean, the truth is, is you take away all my technology, there's uh it gets a little sketchy like me going yeah. and finding some food i'm gonna have to learn some new shit i'm not that smart when it comes to no to, no to i would be surviving be, yeah I'd, I'd be in the same situation to some degree i mean i could hunt it's just you know all right there's plenty of deer out here um i'm sure i could find pig um there's birds but you know i've only got so many arrows it's, you know i've only got you know so many bullets um you know like yeah it'll be different i've got a dog yeah. to feed too <laughs> <laughs> uh I, I i'm gonna rely on my ability to organize people and like convince yeah. like we should go like we should go do something maybe you guys go do that i'll go over here and do this <laughs> yeah uh man yeah uh what what all right so someone's listening to this and man we we went all over the place but i want to bring it back to the to the brain. breathing yeah and how do I know if I'm CO2 tolerant or I've got work to do? Simple. We've got a CO2 tolerance test. We've got a, a breath calculator on power, speed, endurance. It's free. Um, it's linked in my bio on Instagram. Um, or you can just go to power, speed, endurance and put in breath calculator. Um, you'll find it. A CO2 tolerance test is a max exhale test and how long you can actually exhale through your nose determines how tolerant you are to co2 how long how, how many seconds you can spend yeah the longer you can actually exhale just trickling out air without stopping yeah just tiny tiny bit of air you know right? you know what's crazy is um all my experience with breath over the years and uh the, even the last week I've been watching my, well, I'm in one place. I try, I, I usually travel a ton. So progress is not that great for me. Normally I'm, I'm in a maintenance mode most time and I've actually been making progress and I'm watching my progress with my breath and I'm remembering, I go, holy shit, rewind 10 years ago when I was a competitive athlete, my breath then my, my CO2 tolerance then complete shit you you tell me to exhale and hold fucking immediately not doing well immediately uh, my body starts panicking uh I, I i do i look back and when i was putting my body through the harshest uh training and competitions and all that and my breathing was total shit and and that was pro when i look back it's that was the thing that likely held me back the most i mean obviously what was running through my head was dictating so much of that but my breathing was total shit and i always thought i just need to train harder because i'm not in a, as good of aerobic shape it just means i need to do more volume and uh it's it's so crazy 
to hear this now and uh and and to be with this now and to hear you talking about it i hope some uh younger athletes are getting on board with this a lot sooner i mean you, all right so how yeah. long i i did cut you off so yeah. but how long you can have an exhale hold or exhale uh how long you can exhale for through your nose yeah, yeah. through your nose is piercing your lips is really easy to control breathing right ah uh, so if you, you're if you're you breathing actual, up you need glottal control and you need diaphragmatic eccentric control so there's mechanical <laughs> variable there's the physiological variable meaning how actually well you actually do tolerate it physiologically this is going to tell us and then your panic switch how well you can tolerate because everybody's panic switch goes off it's just when and how yeah. right yeah. so it's a three-part test that allows us to understand some things and so if you do it several times in a row like you know do it and then you know relax for a couple minutes try it again relax for a couple minutes try it again you'll figure out if you get some actual neurological control of things right but when it stabilizes and hits that same number you can't go up anymore that's where your baseline is and that allow then you can input that number into our calculator and you can get a bunch of different breathing protocols and the idea behind the breathing protocols is to figure out one that makes you feel like you're kind of upregulated like you're alert but calm which is good and then you want one that makes you feel calm and tired like <clears throat> you could go take a nap right or go to sleep and so the starting point becomes one in the morning, one in the evening, 10 cycles of each, get through that stuff. When it gets really easy, up it or redo your CO2 tolerance test and get the new number and start to increase that variable, right? And there's more advanced stuff people can do, um, but th the basics is actually learning breath control. And you would be surprised that if you stop doing pranayamas and apneas where you're controlling breathing patterns, how quickly they fall off right how, how um, is it how quickly the benefits fall off or is that what you mean yeah benefits and the control got it yeah it doesn't take long so it's you you still want to do these things throughout the week once you get good at them so I, but, i've been doing a lot of like breath of fire like taking pieces of kundalini breath work practices and using those you're saying are you saying what that's not as good and no, there's no such thing. Only thinking okay. is. The thinking <laughs> is, yeah, really, really. But if you want to build CO2 tolerance, you're going to want to start with some slow breath cycles, controlled, right? Well, it sounds so like you have a progression, whereas most stuff I do is, okay. Yeah, that, we're actually training here versus just going and, and doing something that is really random. Oh, I just lost your audio. I don't know what happened. Am I there? Yep. Oh. So yeah, there's training. Most of my day is training, right? It's me considering the fact of what I'm trying to do. Like when I wake up in the morning, and I do breath control. Like I do a breath practice. It's I'm either controlling breathing, doing some CO2 tolerance work, or I'm doing low oxygen work, right? So I'm actually stimulating low oxygen stuff so that I actually have a higher hematocrit level so that I actually have better transport of CO2, better transport of O2. Um, and then there's things like, um, you know, just strictly breath control and learning how to control my breathing, but holding it on a pattern that is just at that edge of where my tolerance is, where I feel like I'm going to need another breath, but I can just get through those breath patterns, right? Then I go and I jump in the gym or I go out on the trails and it's like, for the most part, if I'm not with my girlfriend or friends, when I'm trail running, I'm controlling my breathing when I'm out there, I'm, I'm out there to train and enjoy <laughs> things. But I also, if I'm going to enjoy things, I shouldn't be over breathing. Yeah. Right. And so I just naturally will default into nasal breathing with most of what I do. And it's just the gearing that I'm using. Cause so we developed a gearing system where it goes gears one through five and understand, you know, gear one, obviously being nose only. And that's, that's your main aerobic part, right? And then gear two is a little bit faster on the inhale. 
right? Gear three is you're more anaerobic at that point. Gear four, nose, mouth. And then gear five is mouth, mouth. The interesting thing is the moment you lose control of breathing, doesn't matter if it's mouth or not, you're done. That's when you're hypocapnic. That is, that doesn't matter if you're What's, what's hypocapnic? You are uh, blowing off carbon dioxide. You're just, you're hyperventilating, hyperventilation. Got it. You're basically constricting the blood vessels at that point. You're becoming sympathetically dominant, survival mode. It's over. You're no you're, longer- You've got a limited amount of time before everything starts breaking down. You aren't making down. any decisions anymore. You're freaking the fuck out. Your body, even if you don't think you're freaking the fuck out, your body is actually shutting, starting to shut itself down. You're, you're just in a poor place. And so many, I cannot tell you how many athletes take themselves to that place and don't understand. They're not actually, you're not actually doing anything at that point. Yeah. My, so I, 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 I would say I'm working through one, when I'm running the trails around here, I'm usually between one gears, one and three. Mm-hmm. I, I dip into four. I, I haven't been going into five at all. Um, I, I've also been, had the conversation with myself of I had so much uh, time spent in in that top gear. And, well, I wouldn't even call it the top gear; it was just out, out of control. Yeah. That if I spend a few years nasal breathing only, probably uh, I, I'm likely at the point now where I've healed the the damage enough where I get I'm I'm starting to push it again for sure. So that's yeah, um, man. That that's. I mean- it, it, it's cool to talk to you and you're talking about, oh, it, this is such a, it, what you just described is so fucking simple. It One, is. two, three, four, five. It's not complicated. I understood everything you were saying. I imagine anyone else is going to understand what you were saying. And it's, I, I love that it's simple and hopefully it's going to be taught to athletes yeah. at a much younger age of like, yeah. yeah and I, and I mean, for, boom, boom, boom. For those that are questioning it, it's like, look, we've looked at the data and here's the difference is that the nose controls carbon dioxide, okay? It filters things and works with your immune system for bringing things in, okay? That's important, but it controls the carbon dioxide, okay? I don't absorb any more oxygen breathing through my mouth or nose at submaximal levels, okay? The change is in how much CO2 goes out. And I can just, <sighs> that took a lot. That took double, if not triple the time, right? So, so inhale through the nose, out through the mouth, you're able to get rid of CO2 faster. You just, you're getting rid of CO2 faster. This, so the more CO2 we let out, that leans us more towards burning h- higher levels of glucose strictly glucose. So we're not burning fat anymore. Right. And we're moving more toward glucose and glycogen. Yeah. Right. So we're becoming more anaerobic because that, that it's easier. Right. And so our nose is that governor. You don't need technology or data to tell you this. We're doing that. We're, we're doing all of it. And, and this is what I was, why I love history. They didn't need data. No, they know how to feel. Yeah we lost the ability to feel, which is why we say nature's out there and not here. Yeah. When we start to learn to feel, we start to understand, oh, I am nature. Yeah. My physiology, the, the meaning of physiology is nature and origin. Yeah. Would you think that if athletes get tuned in to their body, mm-hmm. the sensations in their body, uh, they're that they're getting more feedback Mm -hmm. and the necessity to stick strictly to a structured program becomes less necessary. And because you can get more, I guess you could say it's real time data. Like, Oh, I actually feel tired today instead of. Yeah. I'm going to look at a watch and look at HRV and things like that. Elite athletes are actually really good at this already to a large degree it's yeah they do need to fine tune it and understand it more and start to listen to things versus you know let let the let the scientists 
and the coaches and the or the even the doctors use the technology to understand things so that they can tell us what is happening right right that doesn't dictate what you should be doing at all this is our problem with research and i mean look man we started a research foundation so (laughs) not that i don't like research right you're using research to dictate how you live your life or make your next move you're gonna fail yeah that's and that, that's what most does. people that, that's what most people that's what's happening for most people right now yeah especially in our uh, world. and well it, especially in and the performance world but i mean we look at even what's people are uh, when they're afraid this, this is what i'm going back to like people when, when fear strikes when stress hits and people are uh they they, they usually just go to like they're they're their level of training, right? You fall to your level of training, whatever you consider to be normal. And most people's normal is relying on external data or external uh-huh. validation. They're, they want the parent to tell them. And I think that my, my experience with, in regard to scientific research is what's very common is there's a reporter who is a journalist that writes about a study it puts it out oh, or someone is writing a blog and they put 10 citations, but people don't actually read the, the research or the methods or comb through it themselves. And what we end up with is a lot of people who are, and even if they did, you know, everybody's different is I'm, I want a parent. I want an authority. I'm, I'm a child. I want a parent to tell me that it's, I should be taking a thousand milligrams of vitamin C uh, or whatever the fuck it is and have no idea of how it impacts how I feel. I've had so many people, I would, I, I may recommend a supplement uh. and, uh, I may mean, go, you know, Hey, you might want to try this. I'm never like, this will do this for you. I'm like, look, this works for me. I really enjoy it. Maybe like a, a really powerful nootropic, you know, this thing. Like I, I can't even take the whole dose. I feel like I'm blowing my brains out. Yeah. And, yeah. and then people, people take it like, yeah, I like tried two doses, didn't feel anything. And I'm going, yeah, I, I just, I, I know the ingredients in this thing. I don't know how it's not having an impact on you. Like is, it, is it, is it, when I think a lot of times people are expecting it to be caffeine. Like it's, it's like, this isn't supposed to be stimulating in the way that you're used to being stimulated, but so that makes me, those types of sit conversations make me wonder of like, are they just, they just don't even know that they're experiencing something different or they're not experiencing something different at all. And it might be that it's not having the same impact for them as it is for me. And I'm like, and there's all this research that suggests that it is, but, and then people will just keep taking supplements that aren't working because there's research to say that it's, it works for the most people this thing worked in this way with this specific group of people at this specific time and this specific place. Let's see how this works, right? Like Rhonda Patrick put out that vitamin D might help with the COVID thing, right? And that is probably true for people who like, if you want to supplement vitamin D, but do you absorb that vitamin D that you're supplementing? And are you getting sun and like, how, like all these variables? And it's like, yeah, yeah, turns out people who like actually have vitamin D in their life are pretty healthy. Yeah. This isn't a, a crack at Rhonda, like at all. Like she's right. to helping people. She's putting stuff out like sauna. Turns out sauna training could probably help with the COVID thing she put out. Sauna helps with a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sauna mimics endurance training, heat shock proteins. Like it's the same type of stimulus in a different type of environment, right? Um, you know, so it's just, it's a, we, like, I'm not saying don't look at research. Look at research, <laughs> but just let it, don't let, let it kind of let you go into a rabbit hole, not dictate what you're doing. 
right? And that's part of our problems. We think the data, we think this data is what's like the thing. And it's like, no, man, you're the thing. You're the answer. The yeah. entire enchilada. And the more that you look for outside information to dictate what you're doing or how to do it, the less you're going to feel right about it. It's like, well, like going to a different culture and then jumping on a plane and flying back feels weird. It's like, oh yeah, like, damn, like, should I be doing this? I mean, I don't know. I, I like where I live. I mean, I'd love to live somewhere different. Trust me. There's other places I'd like to live and I'd love to live a little deeper and probably out of California, but, um, that time will come, you know, yeah. that time will come. All right. I got two more questions. <clears throat> um, now nah, we'll stick, we'll stick. We'll, I'll stay out of the, the fucking, what? I, I, well, how do you feel about, how do you feel about, um, you know, we've, we've got some people in the government that are making decisions for everybody or mm -hmm. at least making suggestions for everybody. You know, it's fucking 300 million people in this country and, and everybody's different. And yet there's a lot of blanket statements being thrown out about how to manage uh, your health and just social life and everything during uh, this, this situation. <laughs> Let me try this. So I'll go back to the inmates. One of the stories that I did with them, another one. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, hey. And th this was like after like my second month there and I felt really comfortable. Like the first couple times I went in, I was like, fuck. <laughs> like, yeah, but like, this, this is, this is nuts. Um, anyway, I was very comfortable and I brought up this story. I said, look, there's a group of people that decide to give up all possessions move to the middle of nowhere in the mountains in Asia, isolate themselves, and they engage in a breath practice and meditate and find enlightenment and rarely do they eat. What's the difference between them and you? You didn't choose to be here. Do you yeah. want to choose? How do you want to do your time? What do you want to learn? That's the difference. One person made a choice, one person didn't. I have met and know people who've been in situations that I couldn't even imagine in war scenario, right? There's movies made about people, but th the fact of the matter is, is no, there's only one freedom. There's one freedom. Nobody can control that. And if that's what you want to give up, by all means, that's your choice. That's Viktor Frankl. Yeah. In, between, in between stimulus and response is a choice every single time. Rarely do we like to fucking say that, that I had a choice in anything when right. it doesn't go the way we like. Right. When that I what I'm learning right now is that when shit hits the fan, and I don't like what's going, I'm like, oh my God, this is the opportunity. This is it. Like, oh shit, here we are. Okay. <laughs> like I had a guy who I mentored and I, uh, like for three or four months, maybe six months. And um, he, uh, we, we obviously went through all this stuff I was talking about and I, and I get into breath control and all this stuff with them, but it's like, it's not about breathing. And this is what I tell people that I work with. It's, I'm like, look, even though I'm talking about breathing and breath works at the fun, it's at the fundamental layer. We just skipped it. This is why we have to introduce it. But the moment that you believe that breathing is the answer, you just miss the entire point. And this is, this goes back like Bruce Lee and this, you know, this whole thing, like, you know, show where's the moon, you know? And it's like, you point at the moon, and this is the tool, the finger. If I don't know what the moon is, you need to show me what that is. That thing up there. Do I need to actually point at that moon again in order to show you? No, because you understand what the moon is, right? But if you get stuck on the moon, you miss the whole star. You miss everything. You miss the whole universe. You miss everything else that's going on, right? And so getting caught up in all this stuff is what we tend to do. And it's like we forget that we have the answer to everything inside of us. It's just how we choose to see it. And I, when I get a situation I don't like, like 
you know, you need to be vaccinated or this and that. I, I, I don't remember the last time I got a flu shot. Yeah. Why would I, I mean, I'm not saying what I'm going to do with COVID, but who's going to dictate what I do? Last I remember, there was a first and a second amendment. And the first, the second amendment is in place just in case that first one falls apart. Yeah. And I stick true to that. Like, I like, that's just who I am. I'm sorry. I, I treat people with kindness. I like, I'm nice to people. I, I don't want to start a war. I don't want any of that. <laughs> do. But like, look, man, I can say, I should be able to say what I want to say. And I believe I, I grew up in this country in the manner that I did. But the fact of the matter is there's still this thing inside that I have, that is the ultimate freedom. Yeah. And when I let go of all those preconceived notions of what freedom actually is outside of that, I am free. Yeah. And so like, look, man, I, I've always been punk rock. So people are going to go this way. I'm going to go that way. Yeah. I can guarantee it, dude. It's why <laughs> it's why we don't talk about breath work in this woo woo way. Like, yeah, hey, let's just like I could, dude. I could be making thousands and thousands of dollars right this very second by going and doing a bunch of fucking like ramped up fucking trippy psychedelic fucking breathe out sessions with people. Why aren't you? That's so dumb. Because that doesn't fucking fulfill me. Yeah, that's not freedom. That's called fucking unfreedom. <laughs> yeah yeah love it that, love it so anyway I'm, I'm with you man like if, if the crowd is going one way fuck that yeah i mean a problem. I mean, it, it, it probably a problem status quo usually takes you towards you know it's a median thing and it's not interesting like no. they're already doing it why no. like why, why do you want to do what everyone else is Bro, doing? It's I'm a fucking, I'm, I'm an artist, man. Through <laughs> and through. I am. I, that, yeah. That's what I do. I'm an artist. I yeah. show people what they didn't. What they, I see things. I like to see things in a way that nobody's looking at them. So yeah. art is nothing more than showing people what they don't already see, what they can't see. Right. And so that's what my, like breathing. Oh yeah. I don't need to fucking breathe. No, you don't. Here, here's my stick on it. Oh shit. I'd never thought about it like that. There you go. There you go. All right. Last thing. Um, shit, man. I wish I would ask this before because I feel like it belongs earlier in the conversation, but we'll, we'll, we'll end on something practical. Okay. Uh, <laughs> which I actually, people do like to end on something practical. Uh, so the, I noticed that when I'm nose breathing and training, that my mechanics are way more sound. The moment I open my mouth, I start experiencing mechanical breakdown. And that was one of the things that really got me into nose breathing. Uh, most of the time when I'm training, so the moment I open my mouth, I'm like, I should probably just stop anyway because my mechanics are breaking down. Like, why is that? Well, A, you shouldn't have to stop. Like, you shouldn't allow your mechanics to break down if you're mouth breathing. But here's why. And well, I, I, it's like almost automatic that my mechanics yeah. are sound when I'm nose breathing and I have to practice extra vigilance when so, I breathe through my mouth. Yeah. Here's, uh, this is going to be a bold statement, but I believe it to be true. Um, and it's just a belief, so it could be wrong, but all mechanics, everything, the fundamental layer of mechanics is about one thing how you get air into this cage. And if this cage is off in any way, shape or form, there is a compensatory reaction that has to occur. Why would that be? Because I need to get air, I need to get oxygen into the system and I need to offload carbon dioxide in a specific way. And if I am inefficient, if I'm, over, if I'm in a poor position as a result of that, I compensate in order to make up for that, right? <clears throat> And so when I mouth breathe, I can get away with fucking murder because I can move more air quickly. <laughs> My breath didn't even change there. And I'm completely slouched over versus that sucks. That doesn't suck. Right. Right. And 
it, like it's it, it doesn't have to be rigid, right? You just have to understand, like we're the only animal that outside of our gate can we control our breathing. Like, like so. Here's something fascinating about horses. It because they move so much air so quickly when they run, especially the racing horses they don't actually contract their diaphragm at all. They actually leave it in an open state. And what happens is, is the guts when they land drives the air out of that diaphragm. It just, poof, right? And so the air goes, poof. but they don't breathe out of their mouth either. They breathe out of those big old nostrils. Yeah. And, the air, because, and they can't breathe through their mouth because it's not an efficient pathway through to those lungs because when they're running, it's the nostrils and the nose cavity that send that direct message so that that air and all animals are essentially the same. Cheetahs, lions, tigers, fucking deer, antelope, boom, boom, boom. Their gait, when they land, the exhale happens, right? We are independent of that because we're horizontal or we're vertical. Um, and so it becomes more important to understand how much stability we actually have around this place, but how much mobility we actually have, how much we can actually get away with. And this is where like, Oh, that's all I got. <clears throat> oh, now I can move. The <laughs> there you there go. It is, right. Yeah. So this is why we'll, we'll challenge people. Like we'll get them to just hang right. Only nose breathing, full inhale, full exhale, one or two breaths and people are off because they can't even breathe. And it's like, we got what an opportunity. We get to open you up. Like, Interesting. Yeah, man. Hanging from a bar and breathing through the nose. People are having a hard time with that. Oh, dude. Well, well, so we'll do things like where we work out, we put them on a, through a set, and then you got their recovery is hanging and breathing through your nose. I like that a lot. Yeah. I like that a lot. Yeah. But it's not just hanging, going to a plank, man. Yeah. Yeah. You look. And so Rob's putting some stuff together right now, but you'll I did. start to see athletes who are very, very CO2 intolerant when they go <clears> up and hang or they go up and get in these isolated positions, how quickly they start to shake. That's CO2 intolerance. Uh, yeah, yeah. I do. Uh, man, I feel so good about myself right now. I've been doing a lot of this stuff, not thinking about yeah. it as deeply as you have. And well, no, going off of intuition. Engaged, of course you're engaged in it. You're a deeply fucking spiritual person who's like connect, who's been trying to connect, he's been connecting to himself for as long as I can remember. So yeah. You know. it, it, it's been cool. I do uh gymnastic strength work in the morning and it's always nose breathing. It's always about pushing air into every every part that I can and noticing where there's restriction and and uh yeah, the, the breathing mechanics have become it. it I've improved my breathing mechanics so much over the last, so I've been paying attention maybe five years, four or five years, especially, well, yeah, basically I had that hernia surgery and that, that really kicked it off. Um, yeah. Talking to Jill Miller and then realizing all my breathing was fucked up uh, from a mechanics perspective. And uh, I, I've gained so much flexibility and mm. my gait is improved. My running is improved. Like, Things that I used to have poor mechanics on or mobility restrictions, the doing working on breath has had made the biggest difference. And I, I tell people that, and I can tell they they think I'm full of shit or or something. I'm just like, yeah, it's, I mean, it's okay. Between breath and ayahuasca, I'm like, it, it, it I can move. Yeah, and, and ayahuasca, in my experience, has improve my breathing mechanics it helps remove whatever was in the way that was that was causing me to be tight there yeah. so yeah it, it's interesting man you know um interesting times and you know i we're just looking at creating a language that makes this stuff accessible for people and you know i i understand people who are just like yeah like, you know, I mean, like you tell them like breathing's made me more mobile, all this stuff. Like I get why people don't, aren't like, they're like, yeah, right. right. You know, and it's like perfectly fine. You're going to be late to the game. Just so we're, we're, we're clear. <laughs> like, 
the longer you hold on to this, that doesn't mean you need to go sit in full Lotus and, and huff and puff, man. Yeah. You know, but uh, you know, the fact is, is, I mean, these are the exact same things that happened to me that my brain changed, my nervous system changed. Like, I mean, I've more or less, we've figured out what, you know, the, I mean, look, man, addiction is nothing more. And we all have this problem, but you know, it, it's like, it's the dopamine, really the, the dopamine's a hell of a drug, you know? And they what used to be said is cocaine's a hell of a drug. It's not the cocaine, man. It's the dopamine that's accompanying that's going with that cocaine, yeah. you know? And, and addiction is nothing more than an attempt to regulate your nervous system, except I'm reaching for this outside thing, caffeine, alcohol, like, and I'm not saying you can't have caffeine, you can't have alcohol. It's just understanding, yeah. oh, am I using this to regulate myself all the time? If I'm doing that, I'm missing what's going on, like how all this stuff's going on, right? Well, you're not only that, you, you're just missing out on your potential. Oh yeah, but this because is the thing. Like, it's like could, do it. Like my my whole approach is, what can I do without anything from the outside, and then layer in the outside stuff. But I I have a nice consistent ecosystem right here. So when I introduce something, I'm not guessing on what did what. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And I mean, this is the thing: is my entire nervous system has changed. I used to be so sympathetic, dominant. Yeah. so stressed so like on 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 and now i'm just like bro i go into some of the heatest toughest shit of my life and i'm like work through this yeah no problem. yeah like I, i've been training for this i mean breaking almost breaking my neck like oh yeah okay jeez new game like <laughs> work back from being paralyzed but that was my instant reaction versus poor me fuck i just you know i'm like all this stuff it was like no this is an opportunity and i this the reality is is i can't walk like yeah so let's not play in an illusion well here's the thing is and and you keep saying this and i want to reiterate is what do you do when shit hits the fan yeah. when when the stress hits how do you respond and that's where all the practice comes in practice 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 and i know that i've had people look at a lot how I handle a lot of situations and how my life goes and people go, man, I wish I could do that. I'm like, it's been practice. If I didn't, if yeah. I would, if I was not consciously waking up in the morning and practicing breathing, if I wasn't journaling and looking at my fucking thoughts and then asking myself if these things are true or not, or if this is my imagination, just fucking with me and then rewriting that in a way that's, that's, more affirming to what yeah. I, to the reality that I'm, I'm creating or experiencing. Uh, the, these are all the practice. This is stuff that I just do all the time that people go, he's doing weird shit. And then shit hits the fan. I'm just like, yeah, you know what? I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go hang out in Utah and uh, wait for all, I'm going to get away from all the people. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, exactly where we're moving all of our training to this. It's like, I mean, tomorrow I do a webinar. It's called yeah. Oh, I one. saw that. Yeah. And I'm, it, it, it literally is it sold out yet. It, uh, it is, but there's still spots that like, we'll mm -hmm. still, like, cool. we'll open it up. But here's the thing is I've learned how to integrate emotions and thinking and breath control into high intensity <clears throat> work whether that's just a whole, a positional asana or like a, like holding in some yoga position or whether that's doing some sort of work, right? Like on a bike or burpees, right? Identification of these things and then how to actually understand where breath fits in and see the immediate difference of what happens with your emotions when things get controlled and the difference in what you feel and how attached we are to our emotional response to something and it painting a reality that's not true. Yeah. And it's, oh. it, it, yeah, that's what this, yeah. And, and I mean, this is where our work really, you know, I'm, I'm really stoked on how we've really been able to transition this. And I mean, I, I love performance. I love training. Like I love this stuff, but I've always felt like there's this place where it needs to really integrated a high at another level and I, I think we're finally getting to that point and breath control helps with that 
getting yeah. to that and understanding what that is and differentiating what's real and what's not. And that putting yourself into a heightened stress situation teaches you for when you are actually in a situation when the shit hits the fan and it's like, Oh, this isn't that bad. <laughs> like, yeah. like I can, I can manage this right now. Yeah. All right, Brian, thanks for joining us today. Where do they find your stuff? Powerspeedendurance.com. Uh, my Instagram is where I'm most active at underscore Brian McKenzie, M A C K E N Z I E. Um, yeah. And I mean, I've got a website too, that has my bio and consult and, um, mentorship program, which is Brian but most everything is on anything breath control related is on powerspeedendurance.com. Cool. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having I'll, me, brother. Uh, see you around. All right, man. All right. Hey, stay on for a second.